Thank you so much for coming all uh, to uh, Raju's presentation. So, Dr. Raju Kopra, um joined us in 2020, and uh, he got the bachelor and master's degree with, uh, from the uh, uh, Triple one. Triple one University from Nepal, and uh, he's a graduate from that university. Raise your hand. <laughs> See, the majority is here. <laughs> And he decided to get the uh, uh, international career, and he got the uh, MBA from University of Sutherland of United Kingdom, and he moved over to the United States and got PhD degree from the uh, Mississippi State University, and he moved on to the uh, University of Idaho and worked as the uh, postdoc under the uh, policy analysis group for a few years, and was joined us at the uh, Department of Forestry in 2020. In the fall of 2020, and uh, this is the uh, promotional uh, presentation, and it's all yours. Thank you, thank you so much, Haki. It's nice getting introduced and be on the other side. <laughs> so, um, thank you everyone for coming. Um, uh, I'm very grateful. So today, uh, my name is Raju Pokhrel. I'm an assistant professor here at the department. Um, uh, and uh, today, I'm going to talk about woodshed mapping approach, which I developed and utilize in most of my research. So uh, this is a uh, useful approach in identifying location, assessing feedstock availability, evaluating economic and environmental impacts, and attracting investment in the forest product industry. So this is the basic outline of what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to introduce to what is this woodset mapping is all about, and then talk about the research that utilizes Woodshed. So there's quite few of them. So I'm not going to go in the details, but uh, going to talk about how this uh, application is applied and then how that support decision making. And then talk about other projects, few other projects where we are not using Woodshed. And then I will talk about what is going to happen in my career in next two, three or four years. So uh, just to give you some idea about the forest and forest product manufacturing in the United States, there is about 766 million acres of forest, which is about 33% of the total land in the United States, of which 56% is privately owned, 44% is publicly owned. And you can see here that most of our public forest is in the Western United States, private forest is in the Eastern United States, whereas uh, in the Lake State, we host a lot of state owned forest as well. And then uh, the map below shows the distribution of the forest product industry, where you can see most, a lot of facilities are there in the eastern side of the country. There is some in the uh, Pacific uh, uh, Northwest region and sparsely distributed across the um, uh, in, inner mountain regions. And there are about 3,340 facilities uh, as of 2018 data of which um, we host about, Michigan host about 405 of them. So I want to talk about what I do, what I, what is my passion? My passion is on forest product supply and supply chain, and I try to solve these constraints. So transportation distance and time has always been a constraint for this wood product industry um, because that limits merchantability. So if products cannot get from forest to the mills, then they don't have a value. And if they don't have a value, mills cannot operate as well as the forest management cannot happen because forest management is an exp expensive process where you need revenues, you need money to do active management. Another is we are facing a lot of labor shortages in the forest product supply now, especially in the logging and trucking sector. And then there are new investments that can be brought in or coming in the form of new products, markets, and technology. New products meaning this biochar, mass timber, which I'm going to talk about, lignin and other hemp, um, cellulose, nanocellulose. Those are new products. Markets means carbon markets, carbon pay payment mechanism, which is creating new markets, and then technology. New technologies are always uh, evolving and emerging there. And the and nature and location of manufacturing facilities and capacities kind of limits the merchantability as well. So we try to upgrade capacities where it makes the most difference. We try to place the new facilities where it makes the most uh, benefit to the forest management as well as the human welfare. And there's a lot of wrong and fake information in forest product industry as well. Uh, forest product industry is specially touted as a non-sustainable commercial endeavor, which is 
not always true. Sometimes it is uh, even a better approach. If you are tackling carbon, if you are uh, create, trying to create revenues for active management for wildlife habitat and other, other endeavors. So uh, market and policy drives forest management, drives the industry and industry drives the management because it creates revenue, it creates money. Most of the time we forget that. And I, um, you know, I want to study that and you know, that informs and that creates, uh, creates what we need to do the best management. And timely and informed decision making is very, very important. If we want to achieve desired outcome in forest management, as well as in for wood product supply chain, because we need to make timely decision on these management prescription and, and at what extent we need to do that. As well as when a new product is being introduced in the market or new market is being developed, you know, this decisions has to be done in, in a very short period of time, otherwise you lose that window or you lose that investment. So if that information is not available, if there's lack of information on markets and supply, then that deters investors. They are not going to come and invest in it. They may invest in something else, maybe in ag, maybe in uh, you know uh, just making a Walmart instead of planting fruits. And to answer those questions, we need to integrate different disciplines. We cannot answer these questions by just addressing issues in forestry. We need to include economics, GIS, forestry, ecology, and other disciplines. And I, I try to do that. And then here in this diagram, you can see that what I wanted to show is the volume in the forest in Michigan has been increasing, whereas the removals have stayed constant. And the growth to removal ratio is below 50%. So we are not removing enough wood. There's still a lot of wood available for new industry, new uh, um, to utilize for new products manufacturing in the state. So to address those, I create wood sets and wood sets start with something called procurement zones or wood baskets. So to create this, I use, this is a very simple approach with a uh, huge impact. So I use a tool called network analysis in ArcGIS. And basically we have three basic data inputs, the location of forest product manufacturing facilities. And sometimes we use, we have to include capacities, road network data, and then delivered wood prices. So we optimize, I optimize the hauling cost, minimizing the travel distance time to create these procurement zones. And you can see that when we use time-based approach, it elongates across the major roads because the trucks can access or travel faster there, whereas there may be some limitations where there are no roads. So, uh, you know, even if there's a forest and large trees and uh, they, may not, they may not be able to sell their product at a given price. Either they have to sell it at a lower price or they have to just do nothing about those trees. So that affects that. To optimize the optimize based on time, what I do is I use this equation where time is the function of the delivered wood price. So we track price and then convert that into time and optimize that in this tool. And that, that equation can be easily adapted for distance-based approach as well. So distance-based approach is quite commonly used, but uh, you can see that time-based approach is better because it accounts for road and then the road speeds and where are the major roads, where are the forest roads, smaller roads. So once this procurement zone for each and individual facility is created, what I do is I overlap and process them to create the procurement, uh, to create the wood set mass. Here you can see there are four facilities which have different procurement zones at different cost, which is reflected by time here, and then different routes and different forest types. So when you kind of create an amalgam of all of this information, it creates wood sets. So this is a very powerful tool, visualization tool to show complex systems that involve social, ecological, and economic information. And we maybe it can do more than that. And I'm exploring that as of now. It also, it is also a powerful tool in decision making for land managers, 
industry policymakers and stakeholders. They can visualize it and it can be can be used to calculate or estimate other information. Simple applications includes looking at the market extent. Here you can see 27 bioenergy facilities in lake states and their market extent at different cost. So if the biomass cost $18 to $27, how the this shows how the market extent extent changes based on same information you you can calculate the competition hotspots where is the high competition for biomass whereas where is there is no competition for biomass and optimal routes we can also calculate optimal routes or cost optimal routes between the forest floods and the facility and what that does is that helps us calculate these cost curves so how far you can go at what cost and procure wood products um, to, the, to the facility. And once the procurement zones are created, it can be overlaid with FIA data along with its ownership. And then we can calculate something I call the annual sustainable availability of forest products. In softwood logs, we call it ASAW. In biomass, we call it now a net annual um, uh, availability of net annual, um, sorry, I think I have the acronym wrong there. So, but we will talk about that in a, in a minute in, uh, in application. So what we do here is we overlay the procurement zone with these FIA plots, and then, um, we identify because it FIA plot represents about 6,000 acres of forest in the United States. We can calculate how much volume is there how much biomass is there, um, how much uh, removal is happening, what, what's the growth that is happening within that procurement zone uh, versus the state or the uh, county boundary, which is political boundaries and does not make sense when you are looking at procurement zone or cost-based procurement zone for a specific facility. And then that information can also inform economic impact analysis. And usually I use implant, there are other softwares as well. So this is an input output model um, where we calculate the effects of this, uh, these activities in the economy. So direct effects is the initial effect to the local industry from an activity or policy being analyzed, meaning how many jobs are cre directly created at the facility. If you put a biomass facility, how many people are working there? What is the investment that happened there? If they invested 2 million, that is the investment in the economy. If five people work there, that's the job there. And then indirect effects are the effects resulting from business to business transaction, meaning that that biomass facility would need to buy stuff. They need to buy, uh, 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 buy uh, equipment to burn that biomass and produce energy. And then uh, it, has to, uh, it has to buy trucks to haul, uh, Whole biomass. So, because of that transaction, there are indirect effects. More people get employed, more money is uh, invested in the economy. And then, induced effect is like people working in these two sectors get wages. So, they go and invest in um, restaurants and other businesses, uh, in clothing stores. And then, that also supports those businesses. So, more people would be needed, more money would be created in that. So, in direct, indirect, and induced effect, if you sum that, that gives the total effects here. Uh, total impacts from that process. So now I'm going to talk about the applications, how I apply all of this in my research, different research. So um, the most important, I think, application is in the land utilization and resource allocation model. So this is a partial equilibrium model. I worked with Greg Lata, my supervisor at the University of Idaho to develop this model um, as a postdoc. And I still use this and work on this model. So this is a Price endogenous, one to many reason, one to many products reason. So what it does is it tracks all the forest products along with its ownership, productivity, and other characteristic, other conditions. It tracks all the milling facilities in the United States and their demand. And then it also tracks all the ports so that we can uh, account for what is coming in and what is going out in terms of forest products from the state. And then Based on demand and supply, we reach equilibrium, market equilibrium, and create a partial equilibrium where it gives the optimal quantity at an optimal price. And that helps us uh, in decision making. I will talk about the applications in the studies that is happening.
So how does this model works? So this is a dynamic recursive model, meaning that the solution happens in two stages. First one is the static uh, phase where it minimizes the cost of supplying forest products. So the demand are created at the by the consumers and it is tracked through uh, GDP, housing stat, paper consumption and other type of uh, wood product related consumption that informs this facility's demand. So how much demand is created in these facilities and generates demand curve for individual facilities. Unlike other models, in this model, the demand curve is generated for individual facilities, not for a reason, not for the whole country, not national average demand. And then based on that demand, they go to the forest and then um, harvest and then bring it to the mills. And that's where the optimization happened. This is where the optimization happened. And this model optimizes this, this process, the harvesting, bringing it to the mill. So basically it is optimizing the cost of transporting the materials. And that is informed by, what said, my approach. Okay, so this is for the base year. And then once base year is established, optimized, then what happens is Next year is based on this, since this is a dynamic recursive model, next year is informed by the outputs from the first year, base year. So growth and yield happens in the forest. So forest grows and the mills status and the change in the supply, change in the demand informs the uh, demand curve as it, it's milling facilities and the new demand that is being created because new houses would be built, the GDP would be higher or lower uh, depending on economic condition of the country that also informs the demand curves here. And then again, for that year, the equilibrium is created and we can, and uh, equilibrium price and quantity is, uh, is risked and that defines how much harvesting would happen in the forest here. So this wood set can stay constant across the year depending on scenario or sometimes that changes as well. So we can make it dynamic as well, the wood set approach. Here. And then that changes, that goes to year two, three, four, five. Since the output in year, second year is updated by the first year. So this is called dynamic recursive model. And we cannot do a long-term projection based on this because obviously in each projection, you are introducing more error. So this is a very good tool to look at short-term projections like 10 to 15 years, but not a good tool to look at like 100 year projection. So before going, so what are the outputs that come? What, how do we utilize this model? So LURA output basically includes harvest changes in response to policy, industry, supply and demand changes. And that output can be used for carbon accounting. And this was the primary purpose of creating this model. And then this can be also used to calculate the cost of feed stocks for new facilities. And when you upgrade your capacities or the, when a mill is closed in certain location, you know, does the price go up? Does the price go down? Uh, and then also it can be used to calculate what are the logging need, logging and trucking need, labor needs. If we increase capacity, if we increase the production of certain products. And definitely it can also look at the economic impact impacts and much more. So one of the key impacts application of the outputs is on this model called Fosum GRG, Forestry and Agriculture Sector Optimization Model, which is a dynamic non-linear inter, uh, inter intertemporal optimization model. So, so this is not a dynamic recursive model. So that's why we can do long-term projects. And so output from LURA informs this model and then estimates the GRG emissions, which is reported to, this is one of the model which reports uh, the US GRG emissions to IPCC. So there are four basic, four models which reports the US emissions to IPCC. One of them is this model and LURA update, LURA informs the, uh, uh, informs on the harvest changes to this model. So another application on this wood set maps for industry extension and wood woodland owners in the lake states in this, um, in this work, what we did was we created a quasi-interactive woodset mapping tool. There's a link here, and I will post that link along with the recording, so you can click in that and then play around with that tool. This is a web-based tool where you can go, and then you can calculate your 
all time, which I showed earlier, based on delivered cost, here is the form. If you click here, you can customize everything. So user have all the, uh, uh, it has uh, default values, but user has control on how they want to uh, create these maps, optim optimization maps. So here you can see hardwood and pulpwood, but uh, there's results as I'm speaking, uh, this is being built for softwood logs, pulpwood, uh, softwood logs and biomass as well. So it also, as I said, it depicts the market coverage or market extent. It depicts the uh, market coverage for individual facility. So here you saw, this is for the whole, all of the hardwood uh, facilities in the state, in lake states. This is for one single facility. You cannot add facility, but if facility is already there, then you can see how the market changes with different costs. And then you can also look at the competition. What's the market competition look like for different products? So um, next project I want to talk about is the feedstock availability and economic contribution of biopower facilities. This paper just got published in Journal of Forestry. So the objective here is to evaluate resource availability and economic impacts of increasing biomass consumption in existing facilities. You already saw this diagram. So this shows the market extent of all the uh, forest biomass uh, biomass bioenergy facilities in the uh, lake states at different cost. Uh, so this only includes the facilities which were there in 2018. Now I think there are new facilities, so we need to update some of the facilities here. And one of the key thing is there's significant change in procurement zone with small changes in delivered wood prices. Sometimes you know you don't need to increase the delivered wood prices by ten dollars to have a significantly larger procurement zone you can increase by few dollars and then you have a lot of more resource available for that so this is masked with where the forest are so this was this is the places where um, there is forest and then this shows this, uh, this table shows the resource available in addition to what is being already utilized at different costs. So the average price of biomass was $23.27 in 2020. Uh, and I think Jagdish Paul, he's here, he did that survey and then got that number from Michigan. And you can see that there is 9.72 million of extra biomass available on top of what is being already utilized at that cost. So resource availability is not an issue if these facilities want to upgrade and utilize more, uh, more biomass for bioenergy production. I think the barrier is the technology or the other factors or the policy. So that's kind of the finding. And even at $18.16, you can see that one and a half million tons of additional biomass is still available there. And then we use that information to do economic impact analysis. We created different scenarios there. You can read, look at them at the paper. I don't, I, I'm not going uh, to each and every of them, but I want to show you one key finding. So in business as usual, in the region, we did it by state and region. In the region, there were 3,201 3, jobs supported by this industry. If they use all the biomass, which is available at the current price, not even paying more than the current price, that job can be tripled, 11,112 jobs. Same thing with the, with the output. So uh, at present, there is 781 million um, in output or in the economy being create, generated by this industry that can be uh, up to 2.7 million if uh, they utilize biomass, which is economically available. So another study I want to talk about is this case study, which we did for the consumer's energy. So we did it for North Star Clean Energy, and they are this uh, the, 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 the subsidiary of the consumer's energy. So they wanted to upgrade their facility uh, to utilize 680,000 uh, 80, green ton of biomass every year, and they wanted to see if there's enough biomass in the region to do that upgrade, and what would be the economic contribution that is generated by that upgrade. So they were looking at the facility here, Filer City facility, as well as they were looking at potential procurement from UP. 
they were looking at four potential um, potential ports from where they can uh, because they have deep water ports so from there they can bring the up biomass and then utilize in filer city so what we found is obviously there's we have not utilized our biomass properly so there is there's uh, biomass so about 30000 uh, 30 uh, million tons of green tons of biomass is available around filer city at the cost 23 dollars and 25 cents so once you start adding the ports it is it would increase so if you if you had a port in escanaba it would be about 38 million tons if you had a port in menominee and gulliver then uh, 41 tons and if you add other two ports then it becomes 48 tons here we are assuming that barging cost of ten dollars. If you remove the barging cost, these uh, these uh, darker uh, or the black uh, bar shows without the barging cost. And then we build this interactive tool in um, in Excel for them to play around with. So this interactive tool lets them choose scenarios, biomass type, species type, year, uh, and then the cost how much they want to pay for the biomass and then that kind of updates this graph and the maps and everything so that you know they can they can look at they can build their own scenarios and then test there and we input that information would said information in lura as we always do and try to find the cost of feed stock from lura because as of now we are only accounting for removals but we are not accounting for mar markets so what Lura does is Lura brings the demand and also identifies where harvesting can happen. As of now, we are not looking at where harvesting can happen. Based on that, we calculate what is the cost of this new feed stock that is coming into Filer City. So if we are using the biomass only around Filer City without the without bringing it from the UP, then the cost would be about twenty-seven dollars and forty-nine cents for additional per ton for additional biomass. And if we are using all of the ports, then it is about thirty-two dollars and fifteen cents per ton. So that's not that's not really really bad if you are trying to uh, motivate these and incentivize uh, these facilities to produce bioenergy based using forest biomass. And this study is done by my student Tara Elavadi, and I would and you would see the name and picture of the student who conducted this study going forward. And we also looked at the economic impacts, and this kind of was the highlight of the study. They liked it a lot because adding 600,000 uh, green ton uh, per year product utilization would create another 100 million in output in the economy. So that's a significant increase in the uh, economic output, and there would be 220 additional jobs created because of that upgrade in that filer city. Uh, pilot city location. So that the direct job is 40. So 40 additional people would work. 40 additional job would be directly at the filer city, and then there would be indirect and induced jobs. So uh, Norris Kanala, another student, conducted a study to look at the uh, changes in market coverage and competition of wood products industry in Michigan between. 1985 and 2018, and you can see that hardwood facilities, softwood facilities, pulp facilities have been decreasing, whereas number of bioenergy facilities has increased over time. So he used the same approach to look at how the market has changed and how the competition has changed. On the right, you see um, the uh, change in the market. There is not much change in the hardwood, hardwood markets. But uh, they look at the competition, what has happened. So there was no competition or very less competition in 1985. That kind of change in 2002 and 1994. And you can see here, the competition was higher in 2002 in UP. Now that has decreased. So hard, all the hardwood facilities are moving, moving uh, south in the state. And the table shows the area of each uh, area covered within these competition classes. So same thing with the softwood saw timber markets. There is not much change in the market here, but competition has significantly changed. So, okay, I think the competition has significantly changed between 85 and 94. And then there was highest competition in 2002, and then it went down. I think that because of the larger facilities being there, 
because this is calculated in terms of numbers of facilities and then smaller facilities dying off. In pulp, we lost this red area source. We lost a lot of market for the pulp put in Michigan between, between 1985 and 2018. And you can see that the competition, there is no competition and you can see there's just one and two facilities. So almost there is no competition for pulp wood in Michigan. Whereas biomass, we have we have accumulated significant biomass markets from 2000, between 2000, sorry, 1985 to 2018. And there was no competition in 1985, whereas the competition has slowly, gradually increased over time. And the hotspot of the competition is in grayling Gaylord area of the state. So Norris also conducted another study to look at potential location, feed stock availability, and economic impacts of mass timber manufacturing in Michigan. So his objective was to evaluate resource availability, economic impact of mass timber production in Michigan. So what is mass timber? First, let me introduce you to the concept of mass timber. Mass timber is an umbrella term used for engineered wood product manufactured using laminates and includes most common is cross laminated timber, glue laminated timber, laminated winner lumber, and nail laminated timber. There are other forms of mass timber as well. So in CLD, you cross laminate the uh, dimensional lumber. In glue lamb, you kind of uh, uh, laminate them um, uh, in the same direction. And they, they are aesthetically very beautiful and has, have a very less, lower carbon footprint compared to concrete and steel. So that is that is why it is being, uh, being touted as one of the um, one of the uh, one of the product to replace uh, carbon incentive building materials. So uh, this map shows this is the map from Woodbox and shows where are the mass timber facilities are being built and as of 2022 and how many of them are there. And you can see that there was three times more demand compared to 2018 by 2022, and it is projected that the demand is going to be doubled doubled every year from, from now to 2030, or even after that. So Norris put two, lo two facilities, in U one in UP and one in uh, Lower Peninsula, and then looked at what, uh, what would be the procurement zone for softwood um, lumber, and then how, would, how would, is that resource availability there? So you can see all the numbers here are at different cost. Different. This is the current price for the softwood lumber, softwood saw logs, and these are the 20% low and 20% high prices. You can see all numbers are positive, and they are in million, in thousand cubic meters. So there is softwood to produce mass timber in the region. The problem is mass timber is not produced with all softwood. It is produced with spruce and fir and yellow pine in the south. So when we specify those, you can see from the private lands, there is not much of that available. So th this kind of informs the policymaker that, you know, we may have to diversify our feedstock. We may have to use other softwoods, hardwoods in producing this mass timber if we really want to invest in this industry. And then we also did the economic impact analysis. Here also, I'm not going to highlight um, talk about all but one scenario where if we use 10% of the softwood available in the state after accounting for all the other removals, you know, we can still generate in the direct terms 9.28 million in economy in total 54, uh, almost 55 millions, and then 42 new jobs in total, uh, in total 111 jobs. That's in, that's if we put facility in UP. The impacts are higher if we put the facility in Lower Peninsula because there is more businesses and interconnectedness of those businesses, and that kind of creates more economic impact. But if you if we are targeting to reach the rural communities and incentivize development in the rural communities, then um, you know uh, UP is the best place to do that. So uh, based on his studies, um, what ICHA is doing another study to update 
Norris's finding and identify identify optimal location and estimate resource availability and demand of mass timber in Great Lake regions with potential production in Michigan. So he was only looking at Michigan and you saw that there was not enough resources. There was not spruce or fur or not enough uh, of the specific species we, which we used to produce mass timber in Michigan. So Exa is doing this an updated study where she's looking at is there demand? How do we calculate demand? How do we calculate supply? How do we create that uh, equilibrium to come up with the price and the quantity to incentivize these investments. So in this, we are looking at these black dots are the cities where there's demand for mass timber. The green dots are the forest plots where the uh, softwood or the uh, feedstock is coming from. These red dots are the softwood mills where these logs would be converted to lumber and sent to a mass timber facility. And then we um, use a fishnet technique to um, identify potential locations. So we divided the state into fishnets uh, and then put a facility, potential facility at each fishnet. But we moved that to the nearest roads because if there are no roads, then you know you cannot have a facility there. You need road access. So we kind of uh, clamped that to the nearest road. And then we use this equation where we weighted demand and supply equally to calculate the weight on this, each of these locations. So once that weight, weight has been given, score has been given, and then identify that is passed on to in the second step, that is that is passed on to Lura to account for the markets and then optimize the transportation cost. From these facilities, software lumber producers to the potential mass timber producer and from potential mass timber producer to these cities. So we're optimizing the whole process so it can be done at a lowest cost possible. And then we found out that it is most optimal to put the first facility in 2023 near or in Menominee County to produce mass timber. And then second facility in 2023, if the capacity is 50,000 cubic meter near Detroit to produce mass timber. And here you can see these bubbles, blue bubbles. Those blue bubbles represents the forest plots where, from where these softwood logs are coming. And then green bubbles are the softwood processing facilities where they would be converted into lumber and sent to this mass timber facility in Menominee. Here, similarly in the Detroit facility, it would come from this uh, brown bubbles to these solid brown dots where it is processed from locks to lumber and to the uh, mass timber facility and produce here. And then that, that produce mass timber would go to these black uh, dots, which are the uh, demand centers or the cities. One thing you can see is, this was the route. Yeah, I don't know why there's this black dot. But you can see here all the routes that's coming, optimal routes that's coming to this facility and that facility. And especially, I don't know why this happened, but this facility is procuring wood all the way from New York. From New York, woods get pro soft wood get processed to pro procure to Ohio and Pennsylvania and convert it to lumber, and that lumber comes here to get to be processed into mass timber. So it tracks the whole system, identify at a plot level where the wood is coming, which sawmill is processing it, and then coming to the mass timber facility, okay? But we know that there may not be enough resources or softwood is much cheaper in the South. Yellow pine is much cheaper. Or lovely yellow pine is much cheaper. Lumber is much cheaper in the South. And we, if you go to Home Depot or Lowe's, you get two by fours and you know four by eights, all kinds of dimensional lumber, which comes from the South. So it's cheaper to get it from there. We know that. And then there's fir and spruce in the West, which is cheaper than our wood as well. So there may be a situation where mass timber may be built here and then utilized and the houses would be made here with mass timber, but the wood may come from these regions. So we look, we in the next phase, we are looking at this demand scenarios as well. For, uh, looking at the scenarios where depots from where we would procure wood from these different regions and bring it here and produce mass timber. I think this would give more, more chances or more information to the industry who are trying to invest in this mass timber production. 
So next study, which is done by my master student of his Ahmed is on the uh, environmental impacts, uh, uh, environment, environmental um, and economic uh, analysis of proposed mass timber production facility in Michigan. So here also obviously wood said is used for the estimating supply of biomass. And then we are also looking at demand and the price of biomass. We're trying to calculate the optimal price for the biomass using this approach and look at the LCA life cycle assessment to look at what is the net benefit of doing this. So what is biochar? Biochar is a charcoal-like compound. When added to the soil, it creates benefits because it is very absorbent. So it absorbs water, holds it there. It absorbs nutrients. And if you apply it into sandy, uh, sandy, sandy soils, then it is very beneficial. It's not a fertilizer but it holds nutrients and water for a longer period of time and made it, make it available to the plants. So it kind of, um, kind of works in favor, in favor of plants productivity. And it is a very, very, um, very, very important carbon storage material because it stores almost about um, half of the carbon, which would have been burned if used for bioenergy and put it in the soil for a long term, uh, for a long time, uh, almost for 100 years or so. And that's why it has a potential to remove more than 1000 gigatons of carbon dioxide globally. And here, uh, we also did scenario analysis in the baseline scenario, you can see that um, and we looked at two types of facilities here. One is stationary facilities, one in uh, lower peninsula, one in upper peninsula. And then we looked at four uh, moving facilities or portable facilities in both locations. So they don't stay in one place, but move around uh, in these four locations. So based on that, uh, we calculate the feedstock availability. And in, uh, here, all the numbers are uh, positive, meaning that you know, um, you know, there is enough biomass to produce biochar at these locations. Other thing is then we calculate the demand. So we took a scenario where, you know, the basic application is 10 tons of biomass per acre in 30 years time. And then we calculated the demand. What that study informed is if we, if we have a stationary facilities, um, then, you know, almost in all cases, there's enough supply of biomass to produce biochar. But if there's a portable facility, there's not enough biomass to produce those biochars as soon as you go to baseline scenario. And that is happening because the conversion ratio of these port portable units is much, much lower compared to the stationary units. The stationary units converts about 35% of the biomass to biochar, whereas the portable units converts about 18% at max to the bi into biochar. And then we also calculated the price for bi biochar, and you can see in the baseline scenario, um, you know it cost about between eleven thousand. In the baseline scenario, in the stationary facility, it cost between eleven hundred and sixteen hundred, which is quite expensive for biomass. So that's why we want to look at more. We applied for more funding to look at uh, possible ways where we can produce biochar in co-production with other high-value product or utilize waste material so that we can reduce this cost and make it more economically feasible. Because this can help us solve the climate uh, climate challenge we, we are having. And then uh, we also did a life cycle analysis of the biochar, those two production facility, and Chris Saffron from uh, Department of Biosystem Engineering help us with that. And in both cases, there is a net global warming potential. It's negative, meaning that uh, carbon is being sequestered, where you know stationary facilities can sequester more carbon, 1.62 times more carbon than portable units. That's because of the conversion rate, because you know stationary units can um, can uh, convert can convert more biomass into biochar um, compared to portable units. So uh, another study which utilizes wood set is on this um, assessing the wood basket and characterizing Michigan loggers business by the reliance on non-industrial private for forest landowners um, uh, uh, stumpage. So here we are trying to 
evaluate the dependency of Michigan's loggers on non-industrial private forest landowners. And to do that, what we need, what we did was we first created the market extent and then created the market competition for these different loggers and then uh, use that information to calculate the dependency. And what we found was in UP, about 46% of the loggers depend on these non-industrial private forest landowners for their for their business, meaning that they get their logs from them and then sell it to the mills. And uh, here you can see the growth drain ratio, the net, uh, average growth drain ratio um, in the procurement zone is about 2.3, meaning that there is, um, you know, more, the removal is less than the growth. So there's potential for that. And especially in the non-industrial private uh, landowners, uh, the growth to drain ratio is lower than the corporate as well as state, meaning that they are not harvesting at the same level as corporate and state. We cannot compare it with the federal and other privates because they don't harvest at all or harvest very less amount of wood because that's not their objective. And then we also calculated this all this area volume and growth uh, removal um, ratio or the uh, GRD for at different uh, competition classes. And in competition class five, which is the highest, uh, it was higher because there was a lot of uh, forest, uh, private, a lot of federal forest in this, uh, in this uh, category. Whereas if you see, if you eliminate that, then the highest uh, growth to removal ratio is in competition one, meaning that for non-industrial private landowners, there's not much competition among the uh, among the loggers, meaning that they don't non-industrial private landowners, family forest landowners don't have a bargaining power when they sell their logs to these loggers. So this application was also used to identify the priority landscape to um, for funding assistance program in Idaho, uh, where we created. Um, created these maps and that map is being used or was used by Idaho Department of Land to ident identify regions where they want to prioritize funding because they wanted to prioritize regions where they can sell these forest products and create at least cost share or create some revenue in addition to the cost share for the successful implementation of these programs. So uh, this is, all the projects I talked about was about application of the wood sets where we can utilize it and how that can inform decision making at different levels, resource availability, economic impacts, funding assistance, you know, uh, identifying the optimal location to base a new industry. There are other projects I'm working on which does not include uh, include the um, uh, wood set. So I'm going to briefly touch on them. First one is the economic contribution of uh, biopower industry in uh, the Northeast and the Midwest. This is an ongoing project. So these are all the Northern states and there are other states who also want us to do the economic contribution analysis. analysis. Um, this is the uh, preliminary results on the uh, 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 economic contribution from the 20 Eastern states. And you can see one thing I want to highlight is the SAM multiplier for the economic contribution from the biopower generation industry, which is 4.4, which is very high. Meaning that, you know, for one job created in the biopower industry, you know, there are other 3.4 jobs supported elsewhere. Okay, so that create, you can, you can see how the impact ripples in the economy with this, uh, with this industry. This is much higher compared to other, other, other type of, uh, other type of industry. So going forward, we are going to do it for uh, individual 14 states, and we have a plan uh, in process uh, for a workshop to do uh, an economic contribution of energy producer from different sources in May. So another study I want to highlight is the economic trade-off in timber products under various carbon management scenarios. We did it for the uh, Maryland, state of Maryland and state of Pennsylvania. So in this study, we looked at you know, how does the economic returns, uh, return is affected if more land is enrolled into carbon. And what we found is in the states where, where forestry is well established and have a large land base, some scenarios can be beneficial enrolling into carbon, these different carbon managements, like 
afforestation or timber stand improvement or reduce diameter limit cut. Whereas in the states, which are already struggling, that is going to have even more negative impacts because Maryland does not have a lot of land. Their forestry program is not as comprehensive and as established as Pennsylvania. And you can see all of these are in negatives uh, or changes in negatives means they are making less money enrolling into these carbon programs with all these scenarios. And this is without carbon payments, okay? So once you we introduce carbon payments, what happens in is in certain cases, you know, the sign flips, meaning that from negative, it goes to positive with the carbon payments. And those are like in extended rotation, afforestation, restocking, and reduced deforestation. Around $15 and $20 if you start paying that much per carbon for all the carbon stored without accounting for other things, then you know it starts becoming financially, um, financially, uh, uh, financially redeeming. Whereas in some cases the situation may be reversed because you know now you don't get the benefit of carbon because you are you are you are doing more harvesting uh, because you have better wood with TSI or uh, timber land timber stand improvement and then uh, reduced diameter limit cut. So there is a mixed effect. This is still preliminary report. We are still working refining on this based on the reviewers' comment, uh, but results. Results was like some promising information that you know carbon if carbon can be enrolled into program that can produce benefits in certain cases in certain management scenarios for uh, the landowners. So another one I want to highlight is the uh, I help FCCP build some knowledge transfer materials uh, for the state uh, to to understand forest carbon data and modeling. There's a link, you can go there and then look at that. We have expert panel we discussed there. So if you want information on forest carbon modeling and forest carbon data, you know, this is a great resource to explore. So going forward now, um, and these are the projects which were recently funded. So for the next two to three years, I would be working on this. The first one is kind of interesting, which is creating a tool to do economic analysis, economic trade trade of analysis for all Northern states, like what we did for uh, Maryland and Pennsylvania and make it available as a web tool um, and then build some stakeholder education materials on forest carbon, forest carbon programs and what are the payment options available for them. And then also create uh, forest carbon knowledge transfer materials for the states and other foresters who uh, who are working with landowners so that they can help them understand it better. And I'm, I will be also work, working on economic analysis of restoration of northern hardwoods and then uh, explore options for mass timber production in Wisconsin. So other projects in development, I'm, I said that by, for biochar, I'm interested to explore that more. Uh, and then I'm also um, interested to look at the reliance of wood product industry across states because with more car land being enrolled in uh, carbon projects, you know, they may have to go farther away to get their resources. And how does that affect the uh, leakage of carbon with varying policy across the state and region and economic impacts of work world uh, and identifying potential location um, uh, for uh, wildfire and uh, uh, for a funding assistance to, to reduce wildfire risks. So with this, um, I want to show some pictures of our lab. My students have been very good at getting awards at uh, the conferences and meetings, um, poster awards, presentation awards. They have done a good job. Um, and then um, I want to highlight 2020 is pre meeting, which we hosted, and then it brought a lot of attention to our uh, uh, department, uh, as well as my lab as a hub for forest economic resources uh, study. And I would like to acknowledge the funders, uh, all the funders, especially and the staff, especially Katie James. She has been, you know, I applied for maybe 30 grants in last three years and without her, I think I, it was impossible. And then obviously I want to acknowledge other staffs as well. They have supported a lot. Uh, Andy Finley is my mentor, he has been there always when I had bad days. 
And then I have always just barged into his office and asked questions. And he was busy in his coding and always answered me and helped me. And Emily Huff, she has been the co-conspirator on most of my grants and helped me um, uh, through uh, the process. And so this portal, he has been um, he has helped me through my career with funding, with uh, expertise, with data, and what's so not. So I want to acknowledge them. And with that, thank you. And these are my wife and daughters who are my motivation as well as my distractions. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Yes. Um, I am curious about biochar. And uh, um, um, what are the uh, demands? Is it agriculture sector or um, other like, industries in this sense? So um, we went to a field day in Kellogg Biological Station, and there were uh, producers as well as farmers. So there's some demand for that. The most important barrier is the cost. So they want to apply it um, and they want to sell it. And at present, the demand is from more from the landscape uh, and the small, pe uh, small um, you know, uh, landscape people and then a small area, not as a, at a large scale application to the ag, uh, ag lands because of the cost. But uh, people are interested. They are very keen about like, if how can we make it more economically feasible so that we can afford afford it if it, uh, uh, afford it and there are other applications that can be explored for biochar as well you know water purification is one um, you know uh, another is like we put so much salt in our roads that all flows to the lake lakes and the salinity has been increasing so if we can put them in the ditch next to the road it can absorb those salts so there, there are endless uh, uh, applications to that, and there's demand for that, but the most important barrier as of now is the cost of the biochar. And we are trying to just come up with innovative ways to reduce that cost so that it becomes economically feasible. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this, Maju, thank you so much for an excellent talk. Um, you know, I, I love optimization problems, and I'm sort of jealous that you get to do so many in your career. I have to think about how I can do more of those. But, um, just so a broad question I have um, related to optimizations. Um, you know, when you were talking about a lot of your optimization problems, I was thinking about two things. One was uh, sort of what what's the feedback with uh, forest management practices on the ground, and so I just do you have any basic comments about either places where that really impacts um, the result that you got or that you could see where the change would really change the landscape. And then of course, the second thing that I'm always thinking about is climate change. Mm -hmm. And so just it's sort of a similar, similar question regarding that. So uh, that's a really potentially big question. Uh, can you repeat the uh, same question about the climate? Uh, okay. So, um, so um, Scott is asking, um, you know, uh, that uh, what are the implications of the optimization I do uh, in the in the landscape uh, and the climate change uh, arena. So first, I would like to talk about the uh, implication on the landscape. So the uh, optimization we do um, have been used and has been um, it, it's been successful. Like in Idaho, we did that. Uh, funding assistance uh, program, and that was helpful. The state came to us and then asked for that to be done, and they utilized that result, uh, 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 mobilized their funding, and then uh, you know uh, that kind of helped them reduce um, wildfire risk, at least on the urban um, uh, urban wildland interface. So uh, that that has been seen. Another is the case study with the Filer City, which is uh, the applied side in that optimization with that result, what they did was they are going forward with that. So they, they feel confident that there is enough resources, uh, even if like, uh, you know, it's a, it's, it's a broad, broad it's, it's not a exact number. None of the models give exact number. It's not prediction, it's not forecasting. But they are going with that because they feel confidence uh, and they are applying for uh, more uh, support and they, ca they, are, they are taking those numbers to state and federal agencies and claiming like, okay, we are 
going to make a difference why don't you just support us why don't you help us so it helps in those decision making it helps on those policy intervention and that is happening because of of these uh, these approaches being uh, used and in climate change area so uh, as i said uh, you know the work I do informs LURA and LURA informs POSUM and that informs IPCC on GHG emissions. So uh, yes, there is a lot of criticism on how we do the carbon accounting, GHG emission reporting. And this is one of the models on four and we are constantly trying to make it better with better data and uh, you know better spatial resolution, uh, but there is always limitations and the numbers are being used and we can see the projects and the change and things are happening because of that. So at least I'm not sure like if that is actually making change in the landscape in terms of climate change, but it is making making contribution or implication in terms of policy formulation or in terms of uh, impacts on management and impacts on uh, our ability to do uh, climate change mitigation. Do you see any threats just for a brief follow up like um, in terms of I don't know, increase in wildfire risk or uh, change in production rates around the state, like there, or is that something you might be interested in looking at in the future there, the sort of the projections impact on some of these analysis? Yeah, so um, um, Scott is asking, is there any threats uh, because of the wildfires and, uh, and uh, what was the other one? Well, I mean, any of the, so we, we do expect the, uh, greater drought frequency is another one. Yeah, so a drought and fire and other things threat, and can we use this approach to uh, make informed decision on that? So, um, uh, I, yeah, actually, I would like to thank you for that question. I actually, at the moment, I'm working with Forest Service on one of the proposals where we are um, proposing that we use this approach to identify uh, the landscape in the Western United States where we can fund uh, money um, and then uh, so that, you know, there would be fund that money for fuel treatments as a cost share uh, so that meals can come and then take the materials out. Um, so, you know, it's a win-win situation for the industry as well as the forest service. So we are, we are working, working towards that and they contacted me. So there's interest in utilizing this approach. So, yeah. Thank you. Sam? Yeah. Give me that great talk. Um, having the group land on um, a topic that you thought was particularly relevant to, I wonder if you could speak a little bit to um, your project and development on uh, mapping wildfire. Okay. Okay. So, um, um, Sam? Sam asked uh, me to talk about the mapping wildfire risk. So um, I in 2022, I published a paper uh, in Forest which ha where we developed these models to predict uh, wildfire risk and associated modality of trees if the fire happens on that. So based on that, um, in the new uh, work, what we are trying to do is we are trying to build on the, they call it trends one, um, studies uh, or, you know, um, that was done by U USDA. So we are going to build on that, which identified like 23 landscape in the Western United States, which are at high risk of wildfire. So we want to identify markets for those reasons. And if there, were, if there are any facilities, can they procure the fuel treatment materials out, biomass, logs, pulpwood, whatever that can be. And if there are not facilities, were there any facilities in the past which were closed, which we can um, uh, reactivate so that that material can go there and then utilize. And if that is also not there, can we put a facility there which can utilize these materials and then uh, support that, uh, that fuel reduction cost as well as effort in that. So that that is the objective we are trying to achieve with that study. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. And 